A mysterious triple murder of an angelic five-year-old boy and his grandparents leads cops to a rural farm where sickening clues point in the direction of a depraved madman. He sounds like the creepy guy in the basement who's still living with his parents. You know, and they always say highly intelligent, which he obviously was, a loner, no friends. Even though no bodies are ever found, with 1,400 pieces of the most grotesque evidence imaginable, cops have enough to make their move, but so did the alleged killer. Did Doug go on the run? Was he a fugitive at any time? He was. Investigators had Doug Garland under surveillance after their first search of his property. Then two weeks after Nathan and his grandparents disappear, cops catch Garland trying to sneak back on the farm where he lived. The belief was he was trying to get rid of maybe a little more evidence. The sadist didn't get far, as you can see on this police infrared camera. They cornered him because of the helicopter could see him and he finally surrendered. They told him, you know, don't make this evening any worse than it already is and he came out and laid down on the grass and, and they uh, handcuffed him. The man who police believed brutally murdered Kathy and Alvin Lickness and their beloved grandson Nathan finally gets what's coming to him. There's so much evidence here that a movie of the week would not would not buy it. Despite that, Garland pleaded not guilty to three murder charges. The sensational five-week-long trial transfixed a spellbound nation. The community was just gripped by this. The public was watching this like I've never seen them watch another criminal trial right across the country. In opening statements, prosecutors told the three women nine-man jury that Garland held a years-long grudge against Alvin Lickness over a patent for a pump. He had let simmer for years, and then, uh, you know, years later, he finally acted on it. On the day they disappeared, Alvin and Kathy were having an estate sale since they were planning to move and wanted to downsize. So Garland put his sordid plan into action. So if he was going to get them, he had to get them soon he before did. they left. Exactly. The first step, breaking into the couple's home. It appeared Mr. Garland had drilled a hole in one of the locks. The murderous timeline unfolded from there. Once in the house, Garland preyed on his victims. According to his meticulous and obsessive research, 3 a.m. was the best time to attack. Mr. Garland went into Alvin Lickness's bedroom and bludgeoned him. Then he went to the next room where Kathy Lickness was sleeping with her grandson. And was Nathan, the little five-year-old, just collateral damage, or do you think he was also a target? I don't believe he was a target, but he decided that he didn't want to leave any witnesses. Forensic experts believe the family was alive when Garland dragged them from the home and shoved them in the truck. They got pictures of what appeared to be a white sheet you know, in the back of the truck, and the police believe that's where the bodies of the three were. Shockingly, even with all the bloodshed, none of Garland's DNA was ever detected at the house. How do you think it's possible that Doug Garland was able to do so much damage in that house, yet not leave a shred of DNA? Well, he did a lot of research on how to uh, not leave DNA evidence. There were a number of these, uh, these white suits that the forensic people wear when you see them on TV shows. They believe that he was wearing those. Then Garland drove about 20 miles to his parents' rural farm, where unspeakable horrors awaited. Nathan and his grandparents' DNA were found on instruments of torture, like meat hooks, bone saws, and knives. Where was the meat hook found, and, and what evidence was on that? They found Kathy Lickness's DNA on that. They found Alvin Lickness and Nathan O'Brien's DNA on the meat saw, and they found DNA from all three victims on the outside of a pair of rubber boots. But even with mountains of blood and fragment evidence, no bodies were ever found. There was nobody that saw Doug Garland kill them, and they don't even have a cause of death on these people. Incredibly, Garland's elderly mother took the stand against her son, testifying that she didn't hear him leave home the morning the three disappeared. 
She actually had found out they were missing, mentioned it to him, and he says, I don't want to talk about that. Well, he already knew. Perhaps one of the most disturbing images presented at trial, pictures captured completely by chance by a mapping plane which flew over Garland's property the day after the family disappeared. The fellow who took the photos, he can see what appears to be two headless torsos of adults. Looks like they're laying face down, wearing diapers. And a small figure in the grass next to them which is, they believe was Nathan O'Brien, right by the burning barrel. But in this case, the dead speak volumes. There were no bodies, only tiny little pieces. The only proof of their existence on the planet buried in the ashes left behind in the burn barrel. That is where they found one small piece of flesh, which could have belonged to Alvin Lickness, Bone fragments were from a five-year-old boy. So he burned everybody, apparently. Chopped them up, it looks like, and, and then uh, burned the bodies. Just cremated them. While the gruesome details of the heinous crimes unfold in court, Doug Garland appeared unfazed. He sat through the first round of hearings and the second, taking notes. We never heard a denial. We never heard a, I'm sorry. None of the victims' families took the stand. But Nathan's dad's written words reverberated through the courtroom. Rod O'Brien, uh, when he did a victim impact statement, basically said that uh, I didn't even have enough of my son to bury. There was not enough left of him. After weeks of traumatizing testimony and about 10 hours of deliberation, Doug Garland is convicted of first degree murder in all three deaths. They've lost. Uh, Kathy, they've lost Alvin, and they've lost Nathan. So this decision doesn't change that. And they, they still have to grieve. Words cannot describe the pain that Jennifer and Rod O'Brien endure. Though they sat down with Crime Watch Daily, they declined to speak about any details of the brutal murders. Nathan's spirit certainly lives on. It lives on in this, this community. They are coping day to day, raising their two boys, and by creating the Nathan O'Brien Children's Foundation, funded in part by a $1 million donation from an anonymous donor. Nathan loves sports, so mm -hmm. we have an annual decathlon where we have children come out and learn how to play hockey. He would have loved to be part of that, right? Garland received three consecutive life terms for his heinous crimes. For Jennifer O'Brien, that sentence won't bring her son and parents back, but says she gets relief from an army of people standing beside her. Every time somebody says something with a warm, kind, kind word or kind, kind heart, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes they feel uncomfortable because they don't want to say it to us because they're scared they're going to get us upset. And I just say, thank you. Thank you for saying that to us, and thank you for praying for us, mm -hmm. and thank you for showing us that you care, mm -hmm. because it means the absolute world. One of the things Nathan loved, nighttime talks with his dad at bedtime, and one conversation will forever linger in Rod's memory. Nathan had started asking me at nighttime what heaven was like, which it's kind of a strange question coming from a five-year-old and uh, say, well, you can fly around in heaven like a superhero because Nathan <laughs> loved superheroes. There's no night times. You can play all the time. He goes, well, I'm going to welcome you into heaven, Dad. You guys. 